Hi, I'm Helen Witherkin and I'm the Programming Coordinator here at the Wheeler Centre. It's my very great pleasure to introduce today's guest, Sam Vincent. Sam is a freelance travel writer, investigative journalist and author of the new book Blood and, Blood and Guts, Dispatches from the Whale Wars, which the lovely folk from Robinson's Bookshop are selling at the back of the room if you haven't already read it. Sam is a regular contributor to the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and has a degree in international relations from the Australian National University. He's been published in The Monthly and The Griffith Review and when he's not travelling, Sam works as a researcher and editor at the Australian and New Zealand School of Government. Today, Sam will be talking about his experience as an eyewitness to the whale wars and exploring the motivations of both sides. Please join me in welcoming Sam. Okay, so just before I start, I know a lot of you are probably expecting to hear about my experience living with Sea Shepherd, um, my experience in Japanese whaling communities and covering the court case at The Hague. But because I only have 20 minutes, I didn't want to spread myself too thin. And I'm instead going to focus on something that I find more interesting, which is why Australians love whales so much. Um, but if you want to ask me questions about The Hague or Japan or what it's like to take a piss in six metre swell, then feel free to ask me afterwards. Helen's going to have the roving mic. So it's really a privilege to speak to you today, and I, and I thank Helen for the opportunity. And I thank you for coming along. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces, particularly so many members of the Canberra diaspora. <laughs> My hometown, our hometown, turned 100 while I was writing this book. There was birthday cake, candles, and a 34 metre long flying whale with massive memories and too much lipstick. Sky Whale sailed into our lives with the irrational excitement of those people who camped outside the Apple store the other night to get their iPhone 6 before the rest of us. Um, when the balloon finally flew over the city whose centenary she'd been commissioned to celebrate, War of the Worlds like hysteria prompted one bystander I know to pull his car onto the medium strip and alight for a gander. I still can't decide what she most resembles, a bunny upon heat or Sophie Mirabella. In explaining why she had chosen a whale to represent a city whose only beaches were created when a sheep station was flooded in 1963, sculptor Patricia Piccinini wrote, My question is, what if evolution went a different way, and instead of going back into the sea from which they came originally, they, whales, went into the air and, and we evolved a nature that could fly instead of swim. In fact, coming from a place like Canberra, where it's a planned city, that's really tried to integrate and blend in with the natural environment. It makes a lot of sense to me to make this sort of huge, gigantic, but artificial and natural looking creature. There were knockers, sure. Self-appointed arbiters of culture railed against Sky Whale's $350,000 price tag and perceived sexualization. A much retweeted criticism was that she's terrifyingly nipply. But for a generation of Canberrans who yawn at the stereotype of us all being garroted by APS lanyards, sky whales seem to foster an unfamiliar kind of fuzziness, a warmth in the belly that's, that's unfamiliar in Canberra. Civic pride, I believe it's called. In mar early March this year, four days before Canberra turned 101, sky whale gate crashed the National Hot Air Balloon Festival and crash landed in suburban Belconnen making a boob of herself and spawning the immortal Canberra Times headline, Crippled Nipples, A Sag State of Affairs. <laughs> a homesick friend wrote on Facebook from the 11th arrondissement, I love Paris, but I do miss my Sky Whale city. Now, my talk today isn't about Sky Whale, but she seemed a strangely apt place to start. Because just as Sky Whale came to embody Canberra's self-confidence as it celebrated its centenary, I believe whales, sea whales that is, have assumed a totemic role in how we see ourselves as a nation. It is true that the anti-whaling movement has broad global appeal. In the late 1970s, calls for a worldwide moratorium on com commercial whaling became the cause celebre of environmentalism, rooted in, in a need to conserve whale stocks, but in also increasingly a question of morality as more was learned about the social, behavioral and intellectual capabilities of the great whales. The history of commercial whaling, a sad tale of over-exploitation over several centuries, had become a parable for humanity's capacity to destroy its surrounds. By the 70s, particularly for countries that no longer had a consumptive use for them, 
Saving Wales had become, in the neat words of University of Sydney political scientist Charlotte Epstein, shorthand for saving the planet. By saving Wales, we were saving ourselves. Sidney Holt, one of the architects of the 1986 moratorium that is still in place today, wrote on the eve of its implementation that saving Wales is for, for millions of people the crucial test of their political ability to halt environmental destruction. But increasingly, Australia is at the vanguard of this struggle. In the last 10 years, Australia has replaced the United States as the leader of the anti-whaling bloc at the International Whaling Commission. A 2010 poll conducted by UMR Research found that 94% of Australians surveyed were opposed to Southern Ocean, Southern Ocean whaling, and 82% thought their government was doing too little to stop it. Sub subsequent polls have suggested a similar level of support for Sea Shepherd within the Australian community. And it was our government that decided to take Japan to court over the legality of its so-called scientific whaling program in the Antarctic, JAPA 2. Talking tough on whaling has become one of the few bipartisan environmental issues in Australian politics. But why do we care so much? Why did a high school acquaintance of mine take to the internet on the 11th of March 2011 to call the Japanese tsunami karma for killing all those whales? Why does the mere arrival of migrating whales in our waters warrant news coverage? And why do their occasional strandings prompt communities to drop what they're doing and head to the beach to hold vigils and commandeer tractors from local farmers to try pushing them back, back out to sea? The question wouldn't need posing if Australia's environmental policy was consistent, but it is not. As of 2014, Australia ranks fifth last on the Climate Change Performance Index, which assesses what the world's top 58 emitters are doing to curb emissions. Australia clears more native vegetation than any nation in the developed world, and digs up coal as fast as China and India can buy it. Um, and yet, this behaviour does not preclude our whale advocacy. In Anna Kareen's account of the Tasmanian Forestry Wars, Into the Woods, she is repeatedly told by timber workers and industry spokesmen of their chief export market, fuck the Japs. The Sea Shepherd are my heroes, one tells Kareen. I'm right behind those guys, but leave us alone, we're sustainable. I thought I'd find the answer to my question by spending the summer before last living on the Sea Shepherd flagship, the Steve Irwin, as it engaged in its annual game of high seas cat and mouse, cat and mouse with Japan's Antarctic whaling fleet. But Sea Shepherd, in my experience, is not representative of the Australian community. Most Australians are not, like one deckhand from Melbourne I befriended, and just about everyone else on the Steve, militant vegans who consider the killing of any animal morally indefensible. Most Australians do not, like a scouser engineer I encountered, consider whales superior to humans. And most Australians would not, like the Hungarian cook I met, think it fine to head to Yarralumla the next time Japan is commemorating the bombing of Hiroshima to accuse its ambassador of genocide. When I politely suggested she choose a different day to protest, she scoffed and said, why, for the whales, it is their Hiroshima. Most Australians are not, like the young ecologists from the Gold Coast I met, particularly interested in upholding what they see as international law. They are not former whale researchers like her American officer on the bridge, nor self-appointed whale bodyguards looking for a fight like the deckhand from London I met who spent his spare time watching Vietnam War movies. And if whaling, in the words of many of the Steve's crew, is no longer a conservation issue but one of compassion towards our fellow sentient beings, then our national stance is no less hypocritical. During the course of researching my book, I interviewed Malcolm Fraser, the Prime Minister in office when Australia's last whaling station, the Chains, Chains Beach Company of Albany, Western Australia, lowered its harpoons. Fraser cited a more liberal era than today's for the community opposition to Australian whaling that made him act. But when I pointed out that if that were the case, why has Australia's whale advocacy dramatically increased in a supposedly less liberal era, he frowned and said, in some ways, we've got a strange environmental movement or a green movement in Australia. People care more about whales than they do about refugees or asylum seekers. That's not necessarily a distinction which anyone should be proud of. It's a valid point when you think about it. Why do we welcome migrants from the Southern Ocean but detain those from the Indian Ocean? Is grey-skinned prey arriving from a hunting ground more worthy of refuge than brown-skinned dissidents fleeing a killing field? Are they acceptable because they stick to the humpback highway rather than, to quote the federal member for Lindsay, Fiona Scott, clog up the M4? But then, is this issue even about whales anymore? According to the WWF, up to 300,000 cetaceans, that's whales, dolphins and porpoises, die annually as a result of entanglement in fishing nets, but we don't make a fuss about that. Hundreds more are thought to die from ship strikes. There are also the less tangible impacts of human development. 
The on hold James Price Point LNG hub, unpopular in Broome but backed by WA Premier Colin Barnett, was to be built smack bang in the world's biggest humpback carving grounds. And whales have far more to fear from our failure to curb climate change, ocean acidification and melting ice, but being two killers of krill, than from Japan's harpoons. The reception I received and the questions I was asked upon my return from Antarctica, just for sharing the same mess as Sea Shepherd's leader Paul Watson, suggests that the Australian community regards Sea Shepherd with a mixture of admiration for its crew members' goal and jealousy at their commitment to pursue it. Sea Shepherd allows Australians a kind of vicarious outlawry that Hunter S. Thompson, writing about the Hells Angels in 1960s America, called a fascination, however reluctant, that borders on psychic masturbation. But Australians cared about this issue before Sea Shepherd entered the fray. Geography, I think, plays a part. Australia's population is concentrated on its east and southwest coasts, the same coasts that humpback and southern right whales visit on their migrations. Seeing whales, then, is not a foreign experience for many Australians. Indeed, it is possible, even probable, that if you live in even the most urban pockets of these coasts, you've seen them migrating. The hellas are part of the outdoor furniture of our bronzed Aussie self-image, and increasingly so, as humpback numbers in our waters are currently growing by around 10% annually, with perhaps 20,000 migrating up the east coast during the winter of 2014, and closer to 30,000 up the west, the latter the world's biggest population. That it is mainly humpback whales choosing to visit our coasts, a species blessed with charismatic characteristics that make anthropomorphizing them easy, probably helps boost Australian views of whales in general. I wonder how we'd view whales if, we're, if it were only the less acrobatic species like pilots or bowheads visiting our waters. But just as that scouser engineer I mentioned on the Steve Irwin hadn't seen a whale until he was saving them, Sydney author John Newton encountered his first leviathan only midway through writing A Savage History, his whale-loving chronicle of whale hunting, published last year. It was while reading Newton's book that I found the more compelling answer to the question of why we care so much about whales. It doesn't so much have to do with what we think of whales, but what whales make us think of ourselves. Newton writes three times in the space of one chapter that Australia was the last English-speaking country in the world to end commercial whaling. He could have told us we weren't the last country to hunt whales in the southern hemisphere. We pipped Peru and Chile to the post. Or even in the neighbourhood, whales are still hunted off the Indonesian island of Lembata. But those lagging behind don't seem to count because Britain, New Zealand, the United States, and Canada all beat us. Newton seems embarrassed. Australia is living up to its reputation as a colonial backwater, a culturally cringeworthy nation of rednecks lagging behind the times. Because what is it to speak English? To take up the white man's burden, colour the map pink and spread light where once there was darkness. It's to be civilised, and civilised people don't kill whales. Much is now made of the fact that in the Western societies of Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the United States, a happy transition has been made from commercial whaling to whale watching. It's a powerful metaphor for how we sh have shifted our interactions with our surroundings in general, from exploiters to adulators. Moreover, it is presented as the rational one. Paul Watson, the head of Sea Shepherd, frequently points out that given their importance to the global tourism industry, whales are now worth more money alive than dead. Indeed, watching these swimming superl superlatives contributes over $300 million annually to the Australian economy. The evolution in the way we think about whales in this country especially presents a powerful symbol of the notion of progress. It wasn't until 1833, a full 45 years after white settlement, that wool overtook whale oil as the largest grossing export of the Australian colonies. If my grandparents' generation rode on the sheep's back, then their grandparents first clung to the whale's fluke. Whalers, historian James Boyce tells us in his book Van Diemen's Land, were de facto colonists, explorers, ethnographers. They operated in parts of Australia that the Union Jack was yet to reach. They are the very embodiment of the myth that Australia is a nation of pioneers. Fast forward 200 years and the descendants of those whalers were correctly judged by the Rudd government to care enough about whales that spending at least $20 million to pursue Japan's Antarctic whaling program in the International Court of Justice was not just uncontroversial but a politically popular move. I'd wager that in plenty of countries such a decision, expensive, diplomatically risky, of minor conservation importance per se, would be questioned. Here it was met with strong public support. For the Daily Telegraph, the legal action was historic. This heartening decision, the age opined, not merely fulfills a long-standing commitment, it proves the government is prepared to get tough with Japan. 
We do not believe whaling is required in the modern world, the then Environment Minister Malcolm Turnbull said in 2007, the year Rudd was elected promising to take the whalers to court. But then I'd seen this language before. In an email sent to the Steve Owens captain, Sid Chakravarti, and later pinned on the vessel's notice board. Hi, Sid and all. Thank you for your news. It is so good knowing that you are down there in the Southern Ocean amongst the whales to protect them. You represent a change in human thinking, regard and respect for our fellow species, and so ourselves, which parallels other changes in recent centuries like the emancipation of slaves, education for all children, and recognition that we are related to all other life on Earth and we're not made separately. The great slaughter of the whales of the last three centuries is over and, and it is the Japanese whalers that sail against the course of human history while you go with the fair wind of empathy from all the future of human thinking. The world wants you down there and wishes you all success. Yet you inevitably face a formidable and violent fleet of whalers intent on bloodshed and driven by both money and power. Stoking their boilers is the perverse idea, which some people never grow out of, that they are closer to supremacy over nature if they kill other creatures bigger, faster and more mysterious than themselves, no matter how unthreatening, amiable or technologically innocent these creatures may be. I wish you great success and I'm proud to be working with you. On this tiny life field planet, none of us is very far apart. Though you are beyond our visual horizon, your presence and life-saving work in the Antarctic is inspiring countless hearts with its audacity, its morality, and its statement about how we may secure the safety of the whales and, by extension, the future of all life on Earth. We, we await your news. Best wishes, Bob Brown. Note that there's not one reference to conservation, the Southern Ocean Sanctuary, or international law. For Bob Brown, there is only one trajectory for humanity, and it is Sea Shepherd, and by its extension, its main supporter base, the Australian public, that holds the course. A savage history has made way for a civilised future. To help me sort through this civilised thread of whale protection, I emailed Tom Griffiths, director of the Centre for Environmental History at the ANU and one of this country's foremost thinkers on how our view of the environment has changed over time. I'm not sure that the first possible answer, familiarity with charismatic creatures, is persuasive, Griffiths replied. But the second one is much more convincing to me, that whales are a potent symbol of our nation's ecological enlightenment, transformed from first dominant economic resource to subjects of our salvation. Many of the early whaling stations are now embraced within national parks, another symbol of that same moral progress. There is something uncomplicatedly green and good for Australians in looking after whales. Social anthropologist Adrian Peace goes further, arguing that whales have become both metaphoric and metonymic of Australians' relationship with nature at large. For Peace, what is being expressed in looking after whales whether it's on the beach at 4am, on the high seas or in court at The Hague, is the belief that, and I quote, ours is a country which is rational, progressive, informed and intelligent in the way it thinks about nature as symbolised by the whale. When that nature comes under threat, ours is a society which is humane, responsive and in a word civilised in the way we unassumingly but with deep conviction go about our business. In an email to me, Peace suggested that ad whale advocacy provides an anchor for an Australian identity cast adrift in a globalised world. It no longer makes sense to talk about an Australian middle class, he wrote. The relatively homogenous middle class of old has become hugely differentiated, fragmented and diversified as, as a result of rising prosperity and full-scale commodification. For this reason, old icons and symbols, he cited mateship as one, have lost their influence and appeal to those rising new classes. Their place has been taken by novel signs and symbols which are not directly tied to material conditions but are notably emotive in character and those connected with environmental issues are most prominent of all. What's important about this, new, this ensemble of new symbols, Peace continued, which range from recycling to whale totemism, is that they can be made much of without the middle classes having to modify their over slash, slash excess consumption practices in the slightest. In fact, they can be conveniently used as a legitimation for increased consumption, more and newer household goods through the Enviro holidays, including whale watching, rather than cutting back across the board. To paraphrase Adrian Peace and to conclude, whaling, once the economic backbone of this country, has become that most trite of adjectives, un-Australian. Thanks, Sam. That was very inspiring. Um, I will be opening to the floor for questions, so if anyone has anything they'd like to ask Sam, please just raise your hand nice and high and I'll get the mic to you. Um, 
I was very interested, you have described, um, you know, Australia's motivation from a, as a general population for why we love whales. Have you got any ideas about what drives Japan and what the general feeling is uh, amongst the population over there? Yeah, I think same? it's not that different. I mean, I think Australia hugs whales for the same reason Japan hunts them, and that's to locate its house in the global village. Um, in Japan, there's this strong myth that they are somehow a unique nation. Not, not unique in the way that each nation is unique, but somehow uniquely unique. And um, whaling, I think, really, really builds on that myth. Whaling only became a patriotic tradition in Japan when it was questioned by outsiders. So what had been practiced by a handful of communities suddenly became a rallying point for nationalists when it was opposed from, from the outside. And I think... Uh, when the commercial moratorium came into in force in 1986, there was still a market for whale meat, so Japan was able to exploit this so-called loophole and conduct scientific whaling. Uh, there was a market. They could make a little bit of money out of it, but that no long, longer makes sense. It loses a lot of money. The market's no longer there. But this nationalistic shell is surrounding it. And uh, so there's a combination of cultural warriors in the Japanese parliament, particularly the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. But... It's, it's widespread. I mean, even the Communist Party of Japan has this strong anti-Sea Shepherd line. It's, it's no longer pro-whaling, it's anti-anti-whaling. It's a really silly situation. Um, any other questions? I was wondering how it was worked out that um, whale watching contributes 300 million to the economy. I think that's what you said. Yeah, no, I've read that a few times. It's, it's been pretty widely re reported. It doesn't surprise me at all. There's, there's whale watching operations all around the country. I, I went whale watching a few times as part of my research, but I was really whale watcher watching rather than <laughs> whale watching. Um, you talked about the culture of culture warriors in Japan, do you think that part of Australia's support and the fact that Australia's moved ahead of countries like America for support for protecting whales is a bit of a culture warrior thing back at Japan, a country that we see as outperforming us economically and in size and I think education? they definitely perceive that. There was, I was really intrigued uh, in, in the 80s, there was a lot written in Japan about um, how the anti-whaling movement was really jealous jealousy because Japan was getting ahead. I think that's died down a little bit, um, but the way it's been spun by the Japanese government and particularly by the Japanese media, which is a very weak media, so it's, it's liable to be, to be um, manipulated by the government, is that an attack on the whalers is an attack on Japan's way of life. So I spoke to so many people in Japan who don't really care about this issue. They don't like eating whale meat, but but when you mention Sea Shepherd, they, they, they take it kind of personally. So I think that that's definitely the case. Hey, Sam, how are you doing? Good to see you. Um, just wanted to ask a bit about um, the fact that um, Sea Shepherd is direct action. Mm. Um, and um, I've, I've met members of the Sea Shepherd and um, sort of spoken to them because I was really curious about the thing that you mentioned as well about, I don't know, um, uh, members of Sea Shepherd meeting kind of unlikely characters who really support what they do, yeah. um, like members of immigration who would rather be out there defending whales than picking up refugees, for example, on boats, things like that. Um, and I'm, I asked them about, well, why do you think Australians get so behind your non-violent direct action on the high seas and maybe less so here in Australia with like forest blockades and things? Um, and they, um, this one person I was speaking to just reflected back, well, it, it's so removed from, from um, here in Australia, so it's removed from a lot of the context and the kind of, um, I don't know, um, just a bunch of other legal issues and stuff here and we can kind of romanticise it because it's so far away. Um, so I just was wondering if you wrote more or thought more a bit more about like environmental direct action and yeah. you mentioned a few other environmental issues there as well. I think it's pretty exciting and obviously makes for dramatic stories. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, and I think there's always going to be a place for direct action in environmentalism. But what, what I argue in my book is that for this particular case, it's probably the the worst thing you can do. It's just exacerbating nationalism. Um, it's interesting to compare Greenpeace's stance on whaling to Sea Shepherd. They've really pulled out of direct action. They, they last sent a fleet down in 2008 um, because they believe it's just prolonging it. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it's a pretty sexy topic when you see footage of, of these whaling fleets. Um, 
clashing. There's a few other issues at play. I didn't have time to speak about it, but I'm really interested in how Australians perceive Antarctica as, as somehow ours to protect. I mean, Sea Shepherd repeatedly says that they wouldn't need to go down there if the Australian government was doing its job, but that doesn't really make sense because the, the whalers aren't operating in Australia's exclusive economic zone. They're operating in the waters of the Australian Antarctic Territory and, and Japan doesn't recognise our sovereignty down there and nor do they, do they have to. But most punters, I think, still have this belief that the whalers are, are taking our whales. And so that how Australians think about Antarctica is really fascinating to me. I spoke... I mentioned Tom Griffiths, the ANU environmental historian, and I, I met some of his PhD candidates, and one of them told me that uh, he pointed out that Australia is the only country in the world that has a coastline that faces the Southern Ocean. So whereas countries like New Zealand and Argentina, Chile, South Africa, they're all pretty far south, none of them, none of them have that Southern Ocean coast. So there's a real continuation between the bite and Antarctica. And I feel like that has a bit to do with it. And, and the fact that whales are a migratory species, so they, they bring Antarctica to our shores every winter, feeds into the belief that Antarctica is somehow ours. Um, it, was, it was really noticeable at The Hague for the court case. Australia was very careful to not bring up the issue of sovereignty, even though Sea Shepherd does it all the time. Bob, Bob Brown's always talking about our whales and the kind of pervasive possessiveness. So I think that Antarctic thing has a lot to do with it. Um, so you said that direct action, um, in your opinion, isn't quite as effective as it used to be. What do you think is the most effective way of dealing with this uh, issue? For this issue, I think it's, it's a hard one because the vast majority of Australians are vehemently opposed to whaling and they're going to want their government to do something about it, and so they have. Yeah, what I'm arguing, after talking to a lot of political scientists in Japan from diverse backgrounds, is that if this issue could be depoliticised a little bit, then it would probably fade and die. Um, the irony is that no one really wants to eat whale meat anymore, it's just, but it's so tied up with, with nationalism there. And I don't buy these arguments that it's somehow um, it's a food security thing, that if, if Japan gives up on whaling, then there'll be this domino effect. I mean, the environmental movement could, could put resources into Japanese tuna fishing, but they don't really choose to. They focus on, on charismatic megafauna like whales. In fact, I spoke to some sources close to the fisheries agency in Japan, and, and, and there's a belief that the whaling program is really unpopular among fisheries technocrats because there's such a bad odour around that it, 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 it detracts from their work in negotiating on matters of actual food security, but the politicians keep wanting them to, to keep, keep it going. Is there any uh, significant opposition to whaling in Japan or alternatively to the way that the whales are killed, which I believe is um, quite unpleasant for the whales? Yeah. Um, I'm interested there in the distinction between is it bad to eat meat versus is it okay to eat meat if the animal had a comfortable life and was dispatched um, painlessly? I, anyone who's been to Japan will know that animal rights isn't, isn't really big in Japan. Um, no, there's... I think a lot of Japanese people struggle to, to see why Western countries love whales so much. There's not this cultural attachment to the whales themselves. Um, an interesting statistic, Greenpeace has 2.9 million members worldwide. In Japan it has 5,000. Environ environmental movement has really struggled to gain traction there and traditionally in Japan um, when people care about the environment it tends to be, from, from what I've read, the research I've done and spoken of, people I've spoken to, it tends to be viewed through a human prism, so things like water, water pollution, air quality and most notably now nuclear uh, rather than, than this kind of abstract idea of, of saving whales for the, the, the sake of it. Um, so, so no, it doesn't really gain that much traction. Well, thanks, Sam. That was really great. Um, please join me in thanking Sam for his time today. <laughs>